Would you, would you close your eyes with me? I, I just want to lead us in a prayer before, before we get into, into God's Word. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, because as much as we try to run from you, Lord, you always are chasing us with your love. Lord, I pray for each and every individual here in this place this morning, Lord. I pray that you speak to them, Lord, that you speak to all of us, Lord, and remind us how much you love us and how much we need you. Lord, we trust that your word will speak, and I pray for lives to be transformed and healed and delivered and restored. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, we're on, uh, we're on, uh, on the third week of Jonah and the city, and uh, how many of you have not been here for the last two weeks? I, I want to see some hands. How many of you have been here for the, for the first two uh, parts of Jonah and the city? If you were here, at least for one, raise your hand. All right, so hopefully we're getting something out of it. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, first week we talk about how storms are not only inevitable, but uh, every storm has a purpose, right? Everything that we go through in life has a purpose for us, especially for those of us that are in Christ. When you find Jesus, when you find God, and when you finally turn to Him and allow Him to work in your life and through your life, every storm that you go through has a purpose. Amen? Uh, it's hard to understand it at the time because you, 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 you ask yourself, why is God allowing this? Why is God allowing this bad thing to come my way? Why, why, why? But we learn from Jonah that, 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 that Jonah had a purpose to fulfill. And sometimes God allows things come our way so that we can wake up from our sleep and listen to his voice and do what we were created to do. Now, the second way, we, we talk about slowing down and praying because Jonah had to slow down and pray, right? He, he had no other choice. And sometimes storms in life put us in a place where we have no other choice but to cry out to God for help and call upon His name. And He's so faithful that He will answer and He will respond. Well, today we're in chapter number three. We've, we've been doing something uh, kind of different. We, we not often read the whole chapter of the book that we're going to learn from, but since Jonah has four chapters and they're fairly short, we're reading the whole chapter every week. Uh, so we're going to read uh, Jonah chapter 3, and uh, I, I think we have this chapter on the screen this time, and I'm reading from, from the New Living Translation. The, the New Living Translation is just a paraphrased version of the Bible, and it's easier to, to understand in our day. Uh, so I'm going to read, uh, starting verse 1, and it reads like this. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Now, if you were here the first week, you know that in the first chapter, it says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah, and, and God spoke to Jonah. And we made a point of uh, how God is always initiating conversations with us, and we're the ones to listen. We think that we're searching for Him, but the reality is that He has been searching for you and me for uh, our whole lives. He's been looking for us to respond to his call. So this is the second time that the Lord spoke to Jonah and he said, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time, I says, this time Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh. Do you remember the first chapter? It says, but Jonah ran from the Lord. Uh, but this time, it's a parallel. It says, Jonah went to Nineveh. This time he obeyed. A city so large that it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, verse number four, he shouted to the crowds. Listen to the message that Jonah gave. Forty days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. Verse number five, the people of Nineveh believed God's message. And from the greatest to the last, to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. Verse number six, when the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Verse number seven, then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw what they had done and how they had put up a 
put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. I want to talk a little bit about fairness. How many of you have heard someone say, oh, that's not fair? How many of you have said it? That's not fair. It's just, it's just not fair. And uh, how many of you know that life is not fair at times? It's just, it's not fair. You know, I, I, could, I could make a huge list of things that are unfair, that I find unfair, but I'm just going to give you a few. It's not fair for me to stand up here 30 minutes preaching to you while you sit down in a cushioned chair, choosing to ignore me every now and then to think about something else. It's not fair. It's not fair that it takes about an hour of preparation for a minute of preaching and you choose to ignore the preacher. It's not fair. Uh, it's not fair that, that I go to the mall with my wife. Wait, wait, wait for it. Wait for it. It's just not fair. You, you understand me. It's not fair that I go in with 50 bucks and I, if I give her 50 bucks, I get out of the store with two things and probably had to put more money to buy something and she comes out with like 10 different items and still has change for the next store. It's not fair. I'm not that smart or I guess I'm not that patient. But it's just not fair. It's not fair, it's not fair being a dad, right? It's not fair that... that, that and, 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 you know, I already made an arrangement with my daughter. She's not going to grow up anymore. But it's not fair that, that, that I saw her, uh, you know, since she was a baby. And then one day, uh, I can't even say the word. A guy will come and just take her. And, and after I spend all this money on her, <laughs> I guess it wasn't fair for me to come and steal my wife either. But it's not fair that you and I have a roof, have food on our table, have, you know, probably plans for lunch and dinner today. And around the world, people, people are dying because they don't, don't have anything to eat. It's not fair. It's not fair for us to complain about the minimum wage or the cost of living here when people around the world live on less than $2 a day. It's just not fair. Life is not fair. It's not fair that, 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 that we go on a diet and then first thing that comes our way or they invite us to eat, there's something to eat that is not good for us. It's not fair. <laughs> it's not fair that our kids, after we give them everything they need, you take them to the store, they want something, you tell them, no, you can't get that. And they respond, oh, it's not fair. I feel like, oh, you want fair? Okay. We're going to send you out of work every day, and you're going to pay the bills, and you're gonna, we're going to split the bills, okay? Take that, Tito. <laughs> and see if it's not fair. You keep wanting more Legos, and you already have enough Legos, but I'm not fair, really. I could go on and on on saying how unfair life is, because, because it is true. It's not fair. If we compare ourselves to other people, it, we, we can find a lot of things that we could complain about because it hasn't been fair for us. We've been through things. We've been through stuff. We had to carry burdens. We were born in a certain place with certain parents or with our parents. You name it. We, we can find things that are unfair all around us. And the problem is that we, we sometimes equate fairness with equality. We think that fairness is being equal. It, it, it's having the same uh, I like to tell uh, my, my, my youngest one, you know, or when, when the oldest one complains about us doing something for our youngest one, you know, we tell her, hey, you were born two years before. You have two years of more care, more stuff, more food, more toys than your brother, so don't complain, you know. Because uh, we, we think that fairness is equality. But, but it's not the same. However, we can still find a lot of unfair facts about our lives. Think about it. When was the last time that you were treated unfair from your point of view? And you can look and say, that was unfair. That was not fair at all. We can even pray and say, God, that wasn't fair. Why did you allow this in my life? Maybe right now you're in a season of life where, in your life where, where you look around and you think, 
Man, this, this is just not fair. It's not fair for me to be going through this. It's not fair for me to be having uh, to carry this burden. It, it's just not fair. And the story of Jonah shows us how unfair, now listen to me, it, it shows us how unfair God's love is. Because God's love is unfair. Have you ever thought about that? It's just, it's just not fair. His love is not fair. However, His love is perfect. Probably by the end you'll get it. His love is unfair. But His love is perfect. I mean, God gives Jonah an order in chapter 1. He just tells him, you know, you have to do this. And, and I mean, He's the creator of all things. He's the God of gods. He created everything, the universe, the things that we don't even understand. He is the one giving Jonah an order, and Jonah refuses to obey. Why would God chase him and pursue him when, when he could just, okay, Jonah, let's make another Jonah. You know? But he, he pursues him. Totally unfair for God to pursue him because, because it's easier to, to make another one. <laughs> We think. Now, Jonah, running from God, gets on a ship, and then the other men around him have to go through a storm because of Jonah's fault. Totally unfair. I mean, these guys were not doing anything wrong. Why, why would God send the storm to all of them? You know, when you think about storms, we, we, we read the story, for example, in Matthew 7, when, where, where God says, where, where Jesus said, if, if you build your house on, on, on the sand, you know, it will be shaky and the storm will come and will destroy it. But, but then if you, if you build your, your house upon the rock, you know, nothing will destroy it. But, but we've never paid attention to the storm. The one that built on the rock, the one that built on the sand. It, it doesn't matter. You, you build your home on a rock, but the storm's still going to come your way. The difference is that we are anchored in Jesus. So the men in the ship were not guilty, but yet the, 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 the storm hit them. Men, men in the ship cared more for Jonah than Jonah for them. You remember, they didn't want to throw him into the sea. They said, they, he says that they tried to keep him and just make it through the storm. But it was just getting stronger and stronger and so until they had to throw him into the sea. But they felt more burden for Jonah than Jonah for, for the lost people of Nineveh. How weird is that? It's just not fair. It's not fair. But, but, but Jonah survives by God's grace. Totally unfair. Because he deserved to die. Didn't he? He was running from God. He was rejecting God's order. God's love is unfair. Because... God's love still pursued him to save him. Now Jonah prays and acknowledges God's grace upon him and, he, and then the fish vomits him after he prayed and made a confession. God speaks again on chapter 3. Chapter 3, Then the Lord of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. If you read chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 1 says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah. God's instructions for Jonah didn't change. On the first chapter, he told him, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. On chapter 3, he tells them again, go, he tells him again, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. His orders won't change no matter how much we go through in life, either running from him or refusing to do what he has called us to do. The moment you come back, yes, He will redeem you. He will restore you. He will miraculously save you and provide for you and heal you. But you still have a mission to fulfill. You and I have a mission to fulfill. Last, uh, yesterday, we, we went and handed out waters and, and drinks and prayed for people. And you know, I, I have decided that, this, yes, we're going to create atmospheres and spaces for us to enjoy. Uh, in fact, tonight we have a church picnic. If you have not signed up, there's a sign-up sheet in the back of the, of, of, of the building over there. But, but I, I, I've decided that, that we don't need too many programs to do what God called us to do. And sometimes we try to create programs and we get, as leaders, disappointed because you put effort in creating a program and then people don't respond. But I figured out that maybe the reason I'm disappointed is because I'm making the program up about myself, about ourselves, about pride, about the church. 
So lately we've, we've decided to go out and feed the poor and, 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 and pray for people. And you know what? People still don't show up. But I'm not disappointed at all because I know what I'm doing there. Because the few that gathered yesterday knew what we were doing. And it's a joy. I, I was telling Robert, I want my kids to come to the next one. Because I want them to see that we need to pray for people. That we need to give hope to people. Because all that money and stuff will not satisfy anyone. It doesn't matter how much they make. It doesn't matter how much they think they are valued. It, it doesn't, without Jesus, without God in their lives, it, it will not satisfy them. So this time Jonah obeyed. The question is, will we obey? Or will we continue to make church about ourselves and God about ourselves? Because that, that was Jonah's problem. He was selfish. He was thinking about himself before the lost people of Nineveh. Will we go out and tell people about God's love? If not us, if it's not us, who will tell them? Amen. Who will? Now, Nineveh was very lost. I don't know if you can be very lost. I think if you're lost, you're lost, and that's it. But I've been very lost. I remember one time I, I, I lived in, in, in Juarez, and I crossed the border to El Paso, and I went to give a, a, a bass lesson. I, I was a... a electric bass guitar player and I, I was given lessons for it for a season and and I went behind the mountain that, that's there and and I went to to a home of one of my my, my students and I figured I got out of there you know uh, I don't know if you women knew but we men are prideful when it comes to direction so uh, the guy that I was giving the lesson to he said hey do you know how to get back home oh yeah I got it you yeah. know first time I was there so suddenly I'm driving and it's dark, it's late. Now back, I, I, was, I was still a teenager back then. So I had to be home by a certain hour and, and, and I was concerned back then, no cell phones, no, not, not a, nothing of that. I mean, you, you didn't have that. So I'm driving and I'm concerned because I have like 30 minutes to get back home. And suddenly I was lost. I didn't know which street I was at. I, I had no clue. I kept driving as fast as I could, and a little bit later, I was very lost. I mean, I had, if, if the first 10 minutes I had no idea, later I had clueless, until I'm driving and it's very dark, and I just start to see lights, like white lights, like car lights, and I get closer and closer and closer and closer, and I realized that I was on a one-way street. All the cars were coming, so I just turned around, got in the gas station, made a phone call, and asked for directions, and that's how I got rescued. But uh, anyway, you can be not only lost, but very lost. And the people of Nineveh, they were not just lost. They were very lost to the point that God had to say, I'm done with Nineveh. You go and preach against it. Because my anger, because, because I'm going to destroy it if someone doesn't go and preach against them. Now imagine the worst criminal. Imagine that you're watching on the news and, 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 and you know, today you can, you can access all kinds of stories with certain shows that portray the life of certain criminals. Now imagine the worst of the worst. One of those that are sentenced for life, that there's no way they can get out because the, what they did was something terrible. Something that just makes you even get angry at them. Now imagine that God tells you, you know what, I want you to get up Go and preach to him and tell him that I love him and that I want to rescue him if he repents. Some of us would find really hard to do something like that. And that's exactly how Jonah felt. In Jonah's eyes, it was totally unfair for God to send him to preach to a very lost people. Because Jonah was from the chosen people. He felt, we are the chosen ones. We are the ones with the connection with God. We are the ones that have been saved. Why in the world would I go and preach it against them? They're lost. They don't need to know. We are the ones. And sometimes as churchgoers, that's how we feel. We feel, oh, we are the ones. They need to, they need to repent. Yes, but no one is telling them how or who to follow or, or what changes to make. Jonah thought, we are the chosen people and we have followed the Lord. I mean, I have been responsible. 
I made this on my own. They have to figure it out. But sometimes you are the only one that's going to help them figure it out. So the second time Jonah obeys, goes and preaches against Nineveh. And it's just amazing the, the few words that Jonah, or at least the, the passage describes about how Jonah communicated with the city of Nineveh. It says on verse number four, uh, it says, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. That's what he said. He said, listen, this is the message of the Lord. 40 days from now, you will be destroyed. And it's amazing that verse number five, it says, and the people of Nineveh believed God's message. Now, why do you think that the people of Nineveh believed God's message? Because of Jonah's cleverness? It was because of Jonah's obedience. Because obedience to God is chased by God's favor. Obedience to God is chased by God's favor. Favor, Even if when you don't feel like doing something that you know that you have to do because God tells you to do it, even when you don't feel like doing it, but you do it, God's favor is going to follow you. God's blessings are going to follow you. That's what happened. Jonah just did what God told him to do. And God did the rest. Now, next, we we're going to see chapter number four. And if you can start reading in it, in, into it, uh, you're, you're going to be impressed that, that Jonah, even though he went and preached, he still had an attitude about it. He did what God told him to do, but he was still a little bit upset about the outcome. He thought it was unfair. And, and he even tells God, you know, that's why I didn't want to do what you told me, because I think it's totally unfair for these people to get saved. What, what could God do with your complete obedience? Think about it. What could God do with your complete obedience? Let me throw in just a little bit about an example. For example, in your finances. And we know, I mean, here we go. Pastors always talking about money. I, I, you know, I'm not. But the, in, in fact, the, the tithe, for example, is just in the Old Testament. The New Testament doesn't even really talk about it. But he talks about first fruits, you know, and, and about giving to God and about acknowledging that He's the one that gives us and that if we have something, at least something is by His grace. And He asks us to give out of our first fruits. I, I think 10% is for beginners. And some of you have experienced what it means to give beyond 10%. And you have experienced God's grace upon your life. And I'm not saying that you have to do it to be blessed. It comes, it comes out of your heart. And it's just an example. And I just use money because money shows where a heart is most of the times. But, uh, but, but even in other, in other things, like, like forgiveness, God asking us to forgive someone. It's the hardest thing to do. Sometimes you have to do it even when you don't feel like it. But obedience is chased by God's favor. And sometimes we think it's the other way around. If God blesses me, if God does this, then I will. It's the other way around. What, what is amazing is that, that even the king listened to the messenger of God. Your obedience will have an impact on people that you never thought you could impact. You know why? People are disappointed at Christians because they don't see the fruit. They, 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 I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just, we just talk about it. We don't live it. I will try to turn it around, okay? Because it's unfair for me to be speaking this hard because these are hard truths to swallow sometimes. And it speaks to me as well. You know, not because I'm a pastor. I, I, I get to not do certain things. I, I think I'm the first one to do certain things that I think every Jesus follower should do. Stay with me a little bit. I, I, we'll turn this around. Because, because right now it's unfair to feel guilty. And I don't want anyone in this building to feel guilty. 
I want you to feel empowered and find out that God's love is unfair in a way that empowers you to live the life that he has created for you. But the king, even the king, listened to the messenger of God. And he asked everyone to trust in that God and pray to that God. And for 40 days, he said, everyone, even the animals, even, even the animals, I mean, he must have been really scared about the message of the Lord. I don't know, if, I don't know how Jonah did it, but I, I know it was not Jonah. It was the Holy Spirit working through Jonah. It was God working through Jonah. It was the Word of God that was bringing conviction upon the people of Nineveh. And he says, perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. He wasn't even certain that God would answer. He said, maybe, maybe if I turn my life around and, and if I follow, maybe God will forgive. And in verse number 10, it says, when God saw that, that what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. Now, this concept of God changing his mind has messed up many people. Because we think that, that, that God is, is just waiting to see what happens. And then he comes in and, and fixes things. And then I, th I think it, it, it's more complex than that. We, we, think that. we think that because Christians are being persecuted and killed around the world that, that, that God is, is, just, is just losing the battle. We think that God is, is just, man, I'm just going to wait and see what happens. And then I'll, I'll decide. No, God knows everything. He already knows. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about your past, your present, your future. But we are the ones that don't know it. And we have to choose to trust our future to the one that knows it all. And God changes his mind and he did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. The Bible is clear. If you follow me, you will find life. If you listen to me, I will give you peace. If you trust in me, I, I, I will fill you with a joy that even those around you will not understand. If, if my love is there, but if you accept it, if you receive it by faith, it's just not fair. It's not fair, Jonah thought. It's not fair, God. It's not fair for you to send me to preach to these people. It's not fair that, that I refuse to go and you throw me into the sea in the middle of a storm. It's not fair for me to be treated that way, Lord. I mean, you take me into the deep of the sea and, 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 and then I come and preach to these very lost people and you just like that, after they have lived in sin for a long time, you just forgive them just like that? I mean, can we just take turns and take a group of people from Nineveh, take them to the sea and just let them, you know, experience what I experience and so that they can, you know, get a taste of your anger, Lord? It's just not fair, Lord. It's not fair that, that I just refused one time and then they have been living like that all their lives and you just forgive them like that. And that's what I mean when I say God's love is not fair but it has always been perfect. It wasn't fair for God to go and look for Adam and Eve after they sinned. Have you read the, the story of Adam and Eve? They, of course, we, we know all the story about them eating from the fruit. And, and, and God, you know, He warned them. He said, if you eat from this other tree, you will certainly die. That's what He said. He said, you will certainly die. So what happened? They eat, they try to run away. And not being able to escape, God chases them. And He comes to them and He says, you know, what have you done? And they start explaining what they did. And this is a beautiful story of how unfair God's love is. Because after, you know, they confessed and all that happened, it says on Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, that the Lord... God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. God 
made garments of skin and he clothed them. It's totally unfair. God said they would certainly die and now he's covering them. Now if it was skin, there had to be blood. Animals had to be sacrificed for that to happen. I believe that God is showing us from the beginning that for you and I to be released from our guilt, to be cleansed from our sinful ways, blood had to be shed. shed. And that's Jesus Christ going to the cross, shedding His blood for you and I. That's God covering us. That's Jesus covering our sin, just like He did to Adam and Eve. It wasn't fair. It wasn't fair for Jesus to go to the cross. It wasn't fair for Jesus to be treated like a criminal when he didn't commit any sin. It wasn't fair at all. We are the ones guilty, and he took the guilt upon himself. It wasn't fair. Because God's love is not fair. But it is perfect. And he knew that it was the only way that he could show us his perfect love. What are you going through today? That you think it's unfair. What are you going through today that you think it's totally unfair? That maybe you have even asked God, Lord, why are you allowing this? This is not fair. You know that I'm... And what have you been through in the past? Where you see God's perfect love covering you and protecting you and you think it should have been worse. You look back and you think, man, I should have died. Man, I should have. I, should, it, I didn't deserve to be saved from that deal. And when you flip the coin about God's unfair love, to put it in a way where where you find grace in everything you've been through and you see God giving you grace after grace and mercy after mercy, then your perspective changes about the things that you're complaining about because it is unfair. Because the truth is that it has been unfair our whole lives. We shouldn't even be here if we can breathe this because of God's grace. If we can open our eyes in the morning and see the light of a new day is because of God's grace. And because of God's unfair love that keeps pursuing us. Why not trust in His perfect love today? Why, why not trust in His perfect love today and believe that His plans are better for our lives? And believe that if we do what He asks us to do, God's favor will follow us. We're chasing that favor over and over again. We're chasing that blessing when it should be the other way around. We just have to chase God's presence and everything else will be added. And even if it's not added because we have Him and His presence, we'll be satisfied. I think no Christian should be unsatisfied, no matter how bad it's going for them. God wants to fill your cup today. He wants to fill you with His Spirit today. Because some of you, some of you are tired today. Some of you are weary today. Some of you are maybe even a little hopeless about certain situations that you're going through. And God is trying to remind you today, I love you with perfect love. Do you think it's unfair? Look at the cross. Jesus is telling you, I suffered the most unfair death so that you could experience my perfect love. Would you receive it? Is your faith wavering today? Trust in Jesus today. Would you close your eyes with me and bow your head? He will not disappoint you. He will not, he will not disappoint you. His plans will not fail. He knows better than us. It's not fair for us to have this opportunity every day to come clean before Him, 
and to ask for his favor to be on our lives. It's not fair. We don't deserve it, but he does it because his love is perfect. Like Jonah, we sometimes are more concerned about ourselves than we are about those around us. But I think it is time for us to show the world that God loves them with perfect love by us living in that perfect love. If today you need to be reassured in your heart that God loves you, I would love the privilege to pray for you. If you're going through a tough time, a time of doubt, uncertainty, and even a lack of faith, I would love to pray for you. If you say today, Lord Jesus, I want to trust in you even in the midst of this struggle, even in the midst of this disappointment, even in the midst of this trial that's coming my way, I want to trust in you. I would love to pray for you and I I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and I, wanna, I just want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand if you need prayer today? Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, you see these hands. And Lord, you promise to answer if we call upon your name. So, Lord Jesus, this morning, Lord, I just, I just ask, Lord, for you to come, for your Holy Spirit to come and move in their lives, Lord. Give them the assurance, Lord, that you are with them. Lord, wrap them in your arms and show them your perfect love right now, Lord. I pray that you take away all the anxiety, Lord, all, all the concerns, all the, the worries, Lord, of life, and, and that they may be just satisfied with your love and your presence. I pray that you guide them, Lord, to the right places. I pray that you surround them, Lord, with the right people. I pray, Lord, that you bless their relationships, Lord, their children, if they're parents, Lord, their, their marriages, if they're married, Lord, and, and just, Lord, use them for your glory, Lord. Lord, I pray that you provide for all their needs as they follow you and as they are captivated by you, by your presence, by your unfair but perfect love. Lord, we declare that it's a day of victory that in you we find hope now with your eyes closed some of you may realize today that you're not having a relationship with God as you should and you know that the only way to have a relationship with God is through Jesus Christ and by recognizing how much we need him and, and the only way to do that is acknowledging that we are sinners and that our sin separates us from him and the reason that Jesus went to the cross is to pay for our sin and we just have to confess. The word says that if we confess with our mouth and believe with our hearts that He's Lord of Lords, that we will be saved. So maybe today you want to make that confession and make Jesus your Lord and Savior. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I would like to pray for you and lead you in a prayer. And everyone else, I would like for you to pray with us. Lord Jesus, Forgive me of my sins. I need you. Be my Savior. Be my King. I want to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand up with us? Let's sing one more song before we leave. And let's together be thankful. We should be thankful that God's love is unfair. Amen? Amen? It's totally unfair. We didn't deserve it. But it's perfect. And perfect love casts out fear. Want to live without fear? Receive His love. Walk in His love. Accept His love. Get immersed in God's Word. Listen, we have unlimited resources here to, to learn from God's Word. If you are not having access to our Right Now Media Library, make sure you sign up for our email newsletter. You'll get, you'll get the, the, the link there. It's access to over 10,000 Bible studies. We have a daily devotional on our website. We have a church app that can help you engage Scripture. I mean, there's no excuse to not follow Jesus on a daily basis. Amen? Amen. Uh, before we leave and before we sing, after this song, we're dismissed. But I want to... Uh, I just want to uh, open the opportunity for you to... Uh, if you have not been baptized and you would like to be baptized. Water baptisms are going to happen in September. Uh, all you have to do is on your way out on the